It's Sports by the Book at the South Point Studio. Here's Jeff Parles. Huzzah! Well, that's a heck of a way to start a show. Welcome in at Sports by the Book South Point Studio. All I saw in the corner of my eye was Jerry sprinting, sprinting to the corner. Jerry, by the way, still works here, which is good. We had questions about that about 10 minutes ago. You're still gloating about that win yesterday, I didn't you? say anything. <laughs> I didn't say anything. I have no idea what you're talking about. She's Alex White. I'm Jeff Barles. Yeah, I have no idea what you're talking about, Alex. Um, half, of the, half of the Elite Eight is set. Half is set. Uh, before we get into tonight, four games on the docket, more baseball. Um, by the way, our guy, Sean, again, as always, just have to bring this up, and we're going to update people through the year on this. Sean has already declared two days in to the baseball season of when people are, uh, are actually watching in the country, unlike last week when everyone was asleep when the games are going on in South Korea. Sean has already determined that he does not like betting baseball. Is took that true, days. Sean? Not a fan of it. Yeah, see, <laughs> took him two days. Get the, uh, get the whiskey for our guy, Sean. We'll get the barrel. It's Get tough. I think we got to find the teams that we're going to be fading early on and the teams that we're backing, right? I mean, look at the Braves today. Well, the Braves go from 2 nothing down in the seventh to a 9-2 win in Philadelphia. Uh, Freddie Peralta and the Brewers, one hit the Mets earlier in the day, 3-1 final there at City Field. Uh, gave you a loser last night with the Mariners. Sorry for killing the parlay with that. I should have just given you the Guardians. Just fade the A's. That's honestly what we should be doing. Until further notice, they might not play tonight. What would be a very rare rain out in Oakland because it is downpouring in the Bay Area today, uh, as one does, uh, as always in the Bay. But uh, on the college hoops front of things last night, uh, it, uh, start with the East Region. I mean, UConn. I mean, San Diego State basically did as well as they could have for a half. And they then- did. Uh, the lights went out pretty quickly. I mean, UConn put 82 on a top 10 defense, and quite frankly, they left probably about 15 or 20 points on the board because they kept missing layoffs off second chances. Uh, it is just going to be very, very difficult to see anyone beating the Huskies with the way that they are playing right now. This is now nine straight tournament games that they have won by 12-plus, dating back to last year. They're covering by an average of over 10 points on the number. Last night, it was 12, which seemed maybe even aggressive against that defense, and there's never really much of a doubt that they were going to get there. It's just unbelievable what this Huskies team is, and now they are odds-on to win a national championship, and we still have 12 teams left in the field, Alex. It really is crazy, and we were going through our list yesterday of teams who we thought could take them out. Illinois did look really good last night. I think offensively they can hang in there with the Huskies, but we'll see. Um, I don't know. I would like to see somebody else win this year, but how it's looking right now, it's definitely a UConn's tournament to lose. Because you mentioned it, Illinois last night knocked Iowa State out. Uh, You know, really the the concern about Iowa State came came to fruition from the get-go yesterday. Wow. Offense is just not good enough. That now, was a bad first half. They tried. They 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 got it back to two at one point in the second half, but th- that offensive effort in the first half is what concerned me all year with them, where they are awesome on defense. And Illinois, I look, I'll give Illinois credit. Brad Underwood brought it up after the game. At the beginning of the portion of the year, Illinois' defense for about the first month of the season was ranked in the top 25, and then it was a pretty – slow decline all the way through and their defense was really good for a half they did what they needed to do they held on at the end and uh look i'm not saying illinois is going to beat uconn i'm not saying that but i will give illinois a chance to stay in this game just off the nature of their offense now the big problem for illinois will be in a uconn matchup which will fully break down tomorrow and later in the show will be how can they get enough stops to stay in the game and possibly pull off what would be a shocker in Boston tomorrow. I know Iowa State, they struggle offensively, but Illinois' defense looked really good in mm-hmm. that game. So if we can see that performance from them. But, yeah, it, they were the right side the entire game. They were the better team the whole game, besides their free throw shooting, which actually kept the Cyclones in that game. But besides that, it was a, it was clear that they were the better team. The other region, the two upsets last night. 
By the way, Illinois in some books closed the favorite, actually. There was a lot of pick out there at the end in Iowa. It was a little bit of everything. Iowa State won, pick, Illinois won, all available. Depends on what number. Didn't matter. You still got there regardless. Was a slower pace. Iowa State got the pace that they wanted, that they needed to hang in that game, but just couldn't couldn't make layups. Just not enough (laughs) offense in the end. For them, uh, the the West Region, Clemson, Arizona, again in the NCAA tournament against a inferior team. This is now three years under Tommy Lloyd. They have now lost to a team that was at least four seed lines lesser than them in the NCAA tournament. Of course, Houston, a little bit different. They played that that game was in San Antonio. Houston was under seeded. Houston did destroy them in that game. We know Princeton a year ago, and then last night. It's almost like Arizona went on a run too early because they took the lead in the second half, but then Clemson put them away. And credit to the Clemson Tigers, who <laughs> I had. <laughs> oh, man. I had one 11 seed winning. Three 11 seeds, of course, won in round one. The only 11 seed I had winning was New Mexico, which makes Clemson the only six seed I didn't have making it out of round one naturally. Just shows how much I know. And for Alabama, uh, for Clemson, we'll get to Alabama in a second. Uh, credit to them. They haven't been to the Elite Eight since 1980, and here they are with a chance in a football-laden matchup on the hardwood uh, with a, a chance to col- pull a shocker and get to the Final Four. Uh, odds were pretty long to even get out of this region at the beginning of the tournament. Where do you stand on their defense? Now, I know that they've held teams, especially at the three-point line, but where do you stand with a lot of that just being the variance and teams shooting poorly? I think it's a little bit of both, right? I mean, Arizona was dreadful from three, but I thought Clemson did a good job on defense last night. I thought Arizona's game plan was terrible, for what it's worth. I, I would have Clemson didn't really show the ability to stop them going downhill. Right. And I don't know why they abandoned that. Agreed. And I didn't really have the ability to stop Balo. Balo stopped himself by missing all those free throws, but I would have... I did not like Arizona's game plan. And for Clemson, look, you, you got to credit them. Uh, yes, teams are making shots. Yes, are missing shots. Yes, it's the variant of the tournament. Now I can tell you, with the opponent next, Clemson already beat Bama this year. They played him in Tuscaloosa, and they beat him 85-77 back on November 28th. It's not impossible that they beat him again, Alex, and the short line indicates that. Uh, with Bama and Clemson in the next round. You know me, though. I love a revenge factor to mix in there, so I will be adding that to Bama. But I will not make the same mistake because I do have two future tickets left, and I will be hedging from here on out. So Bama is one of them, so I will be playing Clemson in some fashion. So Alabama, the the really, to me, I know Clemson was the bigger underdog, but this was the bigger surprise to me last night that North Carolina leading the game late North Carolina against that defense scored seven points in the first 10 minutes of the second half. I don't know how that's possible against that defense. And Alabama wins 89-87. Really, the the inflection point of the game was with a one-point lead and a little over a minute to go, Jalen Withers was left wide open at the top of the key. No one within a mile of him. 20% three-point shooter. Alabama got the scouting report right. Withers inexplicably takes the shot with 20 on the shot clock. At least 15, yeah. Yeah, I just, that was your your pivot point. The other pivot point was when Baycott missed that uncontested dunk, which would have put North Carolina up by six. But really, yes, credit to Alabama. Grant Nelson was awesome last night. Sears was good again. They shot 42% from three. But that kind of felt more like North Carolina lost than Bama grabbing that game and winning that game. It felt like Carolina let that game get away, and the Tar Heels honestly ruined the day. I mean, R.J. Davis was awful last night, 0 for 9 from 3, uh, and um, overall 4 of 20 from the field, the big old yikes. I don't know what it is about this Tar Heels team either because we talked about them being underrated all year because they were very consistent, rolled through the ACC um, but there was always something, right, that kind of – that they were lacking, and I still haven't figured out what it quite is. All right, let's, uh, let's uh, go to today, and let's start with the first game. The darling of the tournament so far, DJ Burns and the <laughs> NC State Wolfpack taking on Marquette here today. 
This is in Dallas. This is at uh, 609 local time in Dallas, 409 here on the West Coast. Seven, 151 and a half on this one. Uh, Marquette is a seven point favorite behind us, but two predominant books in town just went to seven and a half. So the action on the favorite Golden Eagles in this one. Alex, I'm curious your thoughts here because you know how I've thought about Marquette all year. I, I thought they were overvalued. I didn't think the, the analytic profile matches what the eye test gave. They hard fought game, got it done against Colorado in the round of 32, and credit to the Golden Eagles because that was not an easy game against a really good Colorado team that was that in the end was a lot better than their seed line yeah. indicated uh, talent wise. But here you are, seven and one fifty-one and a half. Uh, a really interesting game, and also too with a North Carolina State team as an eleven seed. All the talk, five and five days. How are they going to adjust in the tournament? Honestly, they first game credit destroyed Texas Tech. Pretty fortunate they got the fourteen seed in round two, and they needed overtime to dispatch at a Golden Grizzlies. So I made this number six and a half. I didn't touch. Um, the spread here, but I do like Marquette on the money line if you want to tie them up with someone else. But I think they get this done and they win here. My main concern here, Jeff, for NC State is, yes, you said that five in a row and then they won the first two in the tournament. They don't want this break and this time off. They were using all momentum here moving forward. I don't think this will be another Clemson upset. Um, They are the lowest power rated team I have left in the tournament. So I know Marquette, there is... Something kind of missing with them, but I mean, again, very consistent both offensively and defensively. And if you exclude the three UConn games, they're 12 and two against the spread in their last 14 games. So I do think Marquette is the right side here, but I made that number just where it is. So this is of all the games today, I want nothing to do with this one. The other three, I actually like, I think they're good betting games. I really do. This one is a hard handicap because of what the unknown nature of how much does NC State have left in the tank really confuses me here. Because if you look at the, again, you look at the profiles of everyone left in the field, I mean, NC State is still 53rd in Ken Pop. I, I mean, there's still yes. a mediocre, like, again, for this stage of the tournament, mediocre is, is a kind term. They're clearly the worst team left in the field. And... It's just at some point, this magic carpet ride has to end. And I, I, again, if they were playing Tennessee tonight, I'd be all over Tennessee at a big number. I think this would that would be the Vols would run them out of the building, especially after what we've talked about with Tennessee going through the game against Texas, where they probably should have lost and survived it. Marquette, I, again, I don't love this Marquette team. They're just taking advantage of the circumstance in front of them. I think they win. I don't know if they cover seven. Definitely wouldn't lay seven and a half because you missed the six and a halves that were out earlier in the week. It's a very tough go of it here to find a legitimate angle in this game for me. The only thing I'd even consider would be going under uh, this 151 and a half, but a lot of these projected totals I see out there have this game at 151. So it's hard for me to, to really find a good angle in this game, Alex. See, and I was definitely leaning to the under. I made it 146 and a half. Um, but digging into it, looking at the numbers, Marquette 21 and 15 to the under. So they kind of lean that way, even though their pace doesn't say it. And on the flip side, NC State, pretty average pace, but their trends all leaned over. And I think that's what they're um, going to try to do here to hang in this game. But so what is stopping you from taking Marquette on the money line? Is it the price or... Does some part of you think that NC State may uh, get this upset today? I'd want more than plus two forty-five if I were gonna if I was saying for, for a price wise at least upset. I mean, if you're looking upset wise, I think the blueprint's pretty simple. It's the two DJs continue to play over their heads. I, I mean, Horn and Burns have been awesome during this stretch, and if the two of them end up being the best two players in this game, yeah, NC State's capable of pulling this upset. Uh, I'm just curious with, again, where Marquette, pretty even game when it was all said and done against Colorado, winning by four. Game was either four or four and a half. Yeah. Uh, there were the three and a halfs early, so book got completely sided and middled when it was all said and done on that game. Uh, but it's, you know, again, I just go back to the fact that I don't trust Marquette. I, I really don't. Now, I still think they win tonight. I don't think this is the right one. Now, 
if Duke were to pull the upset tonight against Houston, we'll get to that game later. I would be fascinated to see where that line comes of, on a Duke Marquette uh, regional final. Be very interested to see where that comes. Houston clearly would be favored against Marquette. It'd just be a matter of by how much. But a Duke Marquette line? I don't know. Especially with the extra data point with Duke having a win over Houston mixed in there. And especially if Marquette doesn't look impressive against NC State tonight. I don't know where that number would come. Right. I mean, what do you, what do you what would you make that right now? Just Marquette minus two. Yeah, that feels right. Uh, that would make Houston only two over Marquette, which I think is light, or two and a half, I should say, uh, based off the current market. Even though your numbers, I know, are a little bit different than what the market is. Yeah. Uh, but I don't know. I don't know. That's tough. I really, again, this one's a really tough one. And I, again, if you want to put Marquette in the money line parlay, go ahead. Find the dance bars. Go ahead. But I, I don't see them. Lo- I don't. I don't like them to cover a, a seven. Right. I, I, no, n- not not liking that at all, Alex. Well, or they could just blow them out, which is they definitely could. I, it's very possible. Yeah, it, but I agree with you. I think that number is right, and you don't want to lay too many points here in the tournament. All right, let's go. You know what? We'll keep it in. We'll keep it in Dallas. Let's keep it in Dallas. Let's do these Dallas games first, and then we'll uh, we'll hit a break here because uh, there may be some moving targets throughout this. Duke and Houston is, of all the games tonight, and we'll get to the Detroit region, which I think those games at Detroit are awesome. I'm a little bit confused on what to do with this game as well, even though I have, I have an idea what I'm going to do with about it, just seeing how the market plays out. The Big 12 is down to one team. Houston's the last one standing. Now, you can't... You can't overreact to tournament success or lack of thereof in the in the NCAA tournament to paint a conference with a broad brush. But the detractors of the Big 12 have to feel pretty good about themselves from what's happened in this tournament, where there was a lot of noise in the during the lead up to the bracket of, hey, why is Oklahoma seemingly on the right side of the bubble? Why is Texas clearly automatically in? Why is TCU clearly automatically in? They don't have the good wins at a conference. They just beat up on bad teams. Houston's not as guilty as those teams, but Houston's best non-con win this year by Ken Palm is Dayton. By the actual eye test was twice against Texas A&M and by the skin of their teeth (laughs) in the round of 32 on that one. Uh, Excuse me there. But um, I, uh, I really, really think that this Duke team is alive tonight. Uh, the big question mark will be, as always, in, in a game involving Houston, how is the opposing offense able to go against that elite defense? And how is Houston's offense able to go against the top 20 defense in Duke? So this one was really tough for me as well, Jeff. I made Houston a five-point favorite here, but something was uh, pulling me towards Duke. Diving into this more, I decided just to pass on it because I don't want to overreact to what we saw from Duke in that James Madison game because James Madison was – you know, the sexy upset pick for that day, and they won 98, I mean, 93 to 55. So now it's like, okay, Duke is wonderful. On the flip side, Houston has to go to overtime to beat a and But sometimes that's a wake-up call for teams, and this is a really good team in Houston, one of the best defenses in the country. So I think they could use that and uh, as fuel for this game tonight. So I decided to stay away. It was a little bit of a lean towards Houston here, according to my number, but yeah, no strong opinion either way. So just going, going to this game real quick. Well, let's starting on the Duke side for me, Kyle Filipkowski, Filipkowski, I should say the most important player in this game for Duke, where those guards, he didn't even have to do anything against James Madison. McCain was so locked in. Again, and, and Proctor, they were so locked in against James Madison. Didn't matter. Didn't matter what Phil Pawski did. And he wasn't great against Vermont, which was a defense first team that blocked the size. It should have been a matchup where Phil Pawski really just decimated Vermont and he had three points. <laughs> he had three points. He had no field goals. He had one field goal attempt. If that happens against Houston, you can't assume with the way Houston defends guards that Duke's going to be okay in this game. 
They need something out of Phil Pekowski tonight. If they get nothing, they're going to lose. Now, if Phil Pekowski plays well, Alex, and relieves the pressure on the guards a little bit, and then it's okay. You know what? We'll take what we won't force. If we get we get reasonable looks, we'll take them. If not, then that's a little bit of a problem. That's and a I, great point because Duke I, definitely has the size advantage. Um, close. Hey, the, the problem with Houston, as always, and this is the biggest thing with Houston, and we almost saw it bite them in the in the round of thirty two. What have we said about a lot of these Big Twelve teams this year? They're just not deep. Yeah, and Houston's not deep. No. Now look, I I I, I did I forgot to mention this on Monday. I got to give so much credit to Ryan Elvin, the walk-on, for going in and making the big free throw in, in overtime when Houston was down to Roberts being the only guy who really plays big-time minutes left on the court uh, in that scenario because everyone else had fouled out at that rate. Um, I will say, as you know, Alex, uh, when Duke plays, the whistle uh, can be unfavorable at times, as, as we know. Uh, but it's... Uh, uh, it, it's still for me when this is all said and done. This is more about Houston than it is about Duke. If that Houston offense does what they did last year, where they Miami sped them up and they brain just exploded in that game, and Miami remember in that game, Miami a year ago in a game that knocked Houston out, Miami scored eighty nine points on seventy possessions. I don't happen to Houston very often, right? So I'm just curious, when this is all said and done, did Houston learn from that? Yes, a little bit of a different team. But if they learn from what has happened these last two tournaments, where, all right, three tournaments ago, Baylor won a national championship, no shame in losing to them. They scored under 50 points against a Villanova team that wasn't particularly good in the Elite Eight two years ago, and they got knocked out in the game where they gave up almost 90 to Miami. Did they learn from both of those experiences that you have to put everything together in order to win deep in the tournament? as opposed to, hey, we can't just have one or the other. Uh, that's what it comes down to to me. I like Duke. I don't think this Houston team is quite as good as they were a year ago going into this scenario, and I just don't trust their offense. And when it's all said and done, Duke actually wins this game outright, Alex, and we get Duke Marquette on Sunday, which, like I told you, I don't know what I would do with that game because of what I've thought of Marquette all year, and they would be in the Elite Eight at that point. And I do feel like that was one of the toughest regions to pick and to go through the bracket side sure. because, I mean, I do feel like Houston has been vulnerable, especially on the offensive side of the ball and their depth. So now getting down and seeing between these four here, but it is alarming, especially after seeing um, Iowa State go down like that and in their championship game, what we saw them hold uh, Houston to. So we'll see which, which Cougars team we get tonight. Well, I will say this, and we, we, we'll talk about this later with the game in the, in the Midwest with Tennessee and Purdue. This thing of in the tournament of when you win a game you probably should have lost, and look, it's a little bit different with Houston. They had no business even being in overtime. We're up 13 with three minutes to go. You're supposed to win that game. But then once the game got to overtime and they were running out of players, it's like one of those are like, hey, A&M, Get this game to the second overtime and you're playing against one starter and, and bench guys who are not relied upon here. And you two Houston's credit, they at least shut that game down in that first overtime and won. Uh, but, boy, I, I just think the way Duke played in those first two games, great with their defense in game one, offensive firepower in game two against yeah. the James Madison team that was really good, and that game was over quickly. I just think Duke advances here and sets up a Duke Marquette showdown. Even though, remember, if we end up with Duke NC State, the two teams played in Washington D.C. two weeks ago at NC State. That was win two, under or win three, yes. I should say, on their miraculous run to the ACC title. Yes, I so there is familiarity it. there. Which again, that's why I said yesterday on the show. I think Mark, I think Creighton has the best opportunity of anyone left in the field to beat Mar to beat UConn because of the familiarity. Weird things happen when you get conference opponents. In the NCAA tournament, we nearly got it in the West. We do have a little familiarity because Alabama and Clemson did play each other earlier in the season. All right, we're going to take a quick break. When we get back, see if Alex has anything else today. Maybe a little baseball, maybe a little hockey. Maybe we'll get Sean's plays. You never know. We'll see what happens. And also, of course, preview the Midwest games tonight. To me, the best region on paper going into this weekend, and those games are awesome 
Gonzaga, Purdue, and Creighton, Tennessee. We break those down and more next. Sports by the book here at the South Point Studio. From the South Point Studio. The perfect blend of sports. But I think the Niners are going to wear them down. Detroit Pistons lost their 36 games. Comedy. See over under on that relationship lasting. I'm going to put mayo in the coffee. Yeah. Yes. I am beautiful. And a whole lot of Pittsburgh. In Pittsburgh. 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 Yeah. Pittsburgh, Pittsburgh, Pittsburgh. Join Ryan McCormick. That's at least two picks outside of our own in the first round next year. Oreo. And host Frank Nicotero. <laughs> <laughs> I look at the clock. I go, ah! Ah! Oh! Watch Punchlines live at noon every weekday. Once you've satisfied your hunger, get ready for more of the hottest casino games in Vegas. Our 24-hour, 30-table non-smoking poker room proudly hosts all the most popular poker games with a variety of betting limits. Visit the poker room for a schedule of daily tournaments. Whether you're going to hold them or fold them, the best place for poker is at South Point Casino. You'll notice that our craps tables are usually the loudest in the casino. If you've never played, join one of our free craps lessons to find out what makes this game so exciting. Check with the craps dealer for schedules and give it a roll. Bingo is also an exciting way to spend your time. We offer seven sessions of bingo every day. And each session includes a cash ball jackpot, 12 bingo games, a progressive double action game, and a $10,000 bonus coverall. Electronic units are available. If you haven't played bingo with us, give it a try today. Guests can also get in on the action at our one-of-a-kind race and sports books. Two separate rooms designed to maximize your experience and comfort. Our sports book, with over 400 seats, puts you right in the middle of the action, 24 hours a day. South Point is also proud to provide a variety of relaxing amenities for the guests who want to be pampered. Soak up the sun and let your stress melt away in our lagoon-style paradise swimming pool. A relaxing getaway where you can bask in the desert sun and enjoy seasonal food and bar service poolside. And if you really want to escape, come to Spa Costa del Sur. From couple suites to a co-ed wet area, our spa caters to business and leisure travelers who want to unwind and elevate their senses. A visit to one of our spa's steam, sauna, or whirlpool treatment rooms will leave any guest feeling like they can take on the world. Our gaming amenities include over 60 table games and over 2,600 of the most popular slot and video poker machines. We have penny slots, including the popular Buffalo games and real machines like Wheel of Fortune, Triple Sevens, and Mega Bucks. If you prefer video poker, try Deuces Wild, Double Double Bonus, or a variety of multi-denomination games. Or try your hand at one of the most popular casino table games in the world, Blackjack. Don't let the game intimidate you. Blackjack, also known as 21, is both easy and fun. And our dealers are always happy to assist. And the best part, Blackjack always pays three to two. Next, check out the roulette tables. Roulette is one of the easiest casino games to learn and so much fun to play. It's a favorite of both beginners and seasoned players. In addition to Blackjack and Roulette, our casino pit features over 60 popular table games like Baccarat, Pie Gow Poker, Three Card Poker, Ultimate Texas Hold'em, and Mississippi Stud. So get out of your room and come join in the fun. Welcome back in Sports by the Book, South Point Studio. I'm Jeff Parles, Alex White alongside. Happy to be with you as always. All right. Uh, real quick here before we get over to the Midwest region with uh, two really big time games. Uh, right now on the women's side of things, there was an upset earlier in the day in Albany. Again, there's four regions, but there's only two regional sites. Uh, they're region one. I don't know why they didn't get like a fancier name than this. Region one, lame. Like, like, name it the Cheryl Swoops region or something like that. Let's 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 get the Cheryl Miller region. Like, let's get some something fun here. Right? Region one, come on. Uh, South Carolina is the number one overall seed. 
close 17 point favorites against Indiana. They're up 12 with 69 seconds to go in the third quarter. Indiana is coming back. I oh, mean, hang in. yeah, hang the in. third quarter was good. There's only so much you can do against South Carolina. Hey, Gamecock team is just so good. Uh, and then Oregon State pulling the upset earlier against Notre Dame is a four and a half point underdog. They went outright 70 to 65. Alex. Oregon State did that even though they turned it over 26 times. The turnover margin was 26 to 5, and 60% shooting will get it done for the Beavers as they pull the upset and make it to the Elite Eight. The Pac-12, uh, with a very realistic chance of getting half of the remainder, the half of the, the, the final eight. Yes, I know Colorado is a dog against Caitlin Clark tomorrow. Uh, UCLA is an underdog against LSU, even though they have the better seed. USC is a shorter underdog than I would have expected against Baylor. Uh, but And then a play you're on tonight, which I will tell you, kind of like it as well. Uh, the Stanford Cardinal, in about an hour from now in Portland, will take on NC State. Both NC State teams playing at the same time uh, tonight on the men's and women's side, Alex. Four and a half and 134 with the Cardinal uh, of Stanford on the women's side. Cameron Brink, a Naismith finalist yet again. Yes, I like Stanford in this one. I laid the four and a half. I know they're coming off an overtime win, but this is a team that's won seven of their last eight, including two wins over that Oregon State team that just pulled off that big upset. Um, really good on the boards. I just think it's a mismatch here against uh, NC State. So I'll say this with, with, with Stanford real quick. I'm still surprised they were not the number one seed in this fourth region, region four. But based off of your your nice little <laughs> printout you gave for me, even though you had South Carolina Upstate instead of USC on here, we'll let that slide. Let that slide. It'll be redone It'll tonight. be okay. Uh, Texas was the second highest net rating of the teams, not including USC in the final 16. So maybe Texas was the rightful one seed in that one. Uh, Texas, by the way, tonight against Gonzaga, five and a half point favorites. Uh, nothing for you on that one, right? Nothing for me on that yeah, one. I, I set it up for Texas and Stanford in the Elite Eight for me. I have no issue with that game. I would make Stanford a small favorite against Texas, but not not a big one. Probably about a one and a half point favorite in that game. I do have a question for you. How much attention the women's or women's tournament is getting this year? Do you think that they will change the format soon where there's no more home teams? hosting and they'll have a um you know like the men's or not yet so It'll this has actually been an interesting um uh who wrote the article today at the athletic um why am i blanking on her, uh, on her name um I, I'll, I'll i'll find it in a minute but the uh it's been a little oh uh, uh nicole Auerbach. there you go that's who wrote it in the athletic i was like wait a second someone who i've had on shows in the past i should remember remember their name um i think it's part of the reason it makes the women's tournament what it is is we see it in the even in the men's time sometimes if you get the wrong sites and the wrong teams sometimes the crowds are pretty bad especially early in the day now for the women's side of things you end up with you end up with scenarios where, all right, there's two games. There's two games in the in, in the round of 64 in one side. If the better team, the the home team, plays the second game, the crowds early in the first game are going to be pretty lame, or vice versa. Yeah, I understand that, but I think it, I think it's part of what makes the women's tournament as good as it is, and it re, and it should reward. I have no problem. It will never happen in men's tournament because they're never moving back off neutral sites, but rewarding the top 16 teams. I think that's a pretty good reward. Yeah. Make you get one of those top 16 seeds. You should have home court. And I think it really does help. It helps attendance. Yes. And it helps a lot of things to the positive that I just don't see that move happen. Now, five years from now, maybe different, but right now, I think they're good with the with the with the home sites. Great points. I didn't I didn't think about that. I guess I'm just watching all these Iowa fans travel wherever and thinking that everybody is doing that. But you're right, and I I am for um, working towards something and getting those top 16 seats and being rewarded for that. Yeah. Well, again, I will say the only the only team that got more calls than Iowa uh, this week were the Lakers. So 
Uh, expect that more through the rest of the way. I still, and I said it. I said, tomorrow? I said it to Frank on Tuesday. I feel so bad for for West Virginia. They got so hosed by the refs earlier in the week, uh, where fought back in the game. It just every whistle down the stretch was wrong and in favor of Iowa, except for the one and one, which was a legitimate foul on West Virginia. Uh, but hey, it, it, it happens. It happens. Uh, by the way, we'll, we'll, I'll bring it up tomorrow. I am going to be on Colorado, though, in that game. Pac-12 teams are – Pac-12 was the best conference in, co- in, co- in women's college basketball by a significant margin. Colorado beat LSU here in Vegas on the opening night of the season handily yes. as well. Uh, Buffs got the number one in the country for a chunk of – for a, a small portion of time this year as well. That is a legitimate team. And I was all offense. All not, offense. Not, not great all defensively. Offense, 100%. All right. By the way, South Carolina is up 10 going into the fourth quarter. All right, let's go to Detroit. Motown. Numbers coming back down. People betting Gonzaga here um, from five and a half to four and a half. Most of the market. Chris and company still with the lone five left in it. Uh, total 155. I, You know, I will say this. Open four and a half. I thought that number was right. So I was a little surprised at the take of Purdue right out of the gate. But now, coming back the other way, with that market really stabilized at five and a half for a big chunk of the week, I'm a little surprised at how aggressive the market is coming back on Gonzaga right now. So, Alex, I'll give you the floor first. That now at five and four and a half, it's a very different handicap than it would have been a few minutes ago, uh, even uh, when there was still some five and a halves around. I, I went ahead and took the points here, the five and a half with Gonzaga. One of my Good main job. reasons for this is because these two have seen each other already in the Maui Invitational. Gonzaga was leading that game at halftime, very easily could have won that game. So these are two completely different teams. Gonzaga has been playing much better as of late and not just a fluke. The last 10 games they have been shooting Above 50%, except for one in that game against St. Mary's that they lost. But So I think the, um, Gonzaga really can uh, bring it offensively and hang in this game with Purdue. We know Purdue struggles. They're going to have a lot of pressure on him here to win this Sweet 16 game. So I think uh, there's some value here taking the points. By the way, quick shout-out to our guy Sean Higgs watching us as always. Sean, good to see you, my man. Good to see you as always. Uh, Jersey Pride. New Jersey pride, to say the very least, for our guy Sean Higgs uh, watching us there. Uh, if you're wa- if you are watching us right now and you are not subscribed, please just hit that subscribe button. It takes two seconds. It's free, and uh, if it's for if it's for free, it's for me, and it should be for you as well. See, there we go. I uh, had to work that in as well. Uh, I- I'll just ask you this, Alex. Where when we get into a game with Purdue, when the question is always. How is the opposing team going to slow down Zach Eady? That's always the question. And I will say this with Gonzaga, and I will give Gonzaga a lot of credit for what they've done so far in this tournament. And yeah, you could have some question marks of, all right, how much of it was them and how much it was the fact that, that McNeese was DOA in that game and how much of it that Kansas was totally out of gas after the explosive first half, and then Gonzaga rolled them in the final 20. But Gonzaga does have enough bodies in the front court to throw at Edie and at least make his life a little bit difficult. And by having more bodies, look, you have Ben Gregg, you have Huff, you have EK. EK's had problems with fouls this whole year. So I would be a little bit cautious with EK on him. But you have height. I mean, even Watson's 6'8", even though he doesn't play as a big for the most part. He, they have they have bodies. They have twenty fouls to give for the six eight enough players, and this could be a harder matchup for Edie just because of the variety of looks Gonzaga can give him tonight. And to your point, Jeff, a lot of those big guys are younger guys. Ben Gregg is a freshman, I believe, and I looked back at that first game. He had just two points in that first game that yep. that they played against Purdue. So we've seen him really transform through the season and a lot of these young guys. So I'm with you. I think um, it's a different team and they can hang in there. Edie at 25 and nine in that game in uh, Honolulu. That was a Maui. Yeah. Uh, great draw for Gonzaga. First game of Maui. Oh, you get Purdue. Great. Awesome. Perfect. Uh, and then having to play the losers bracket after losing that game to Purdue. Um, you mentioned uh, 
You mentioned Greg. Greg, like you said, struggled immensely in that game. So did Braden Huff as well. So the younger guys struggled. Full season under the belts, yep. playing better, more confidence. Again, I think Gonzaga's live to pull this upset outright. I'm not sure if I'm all the way there because I think the one other factor that we miss with Purdue, and I have to at least give their guards some credit because their guards have played really well for the most part this year. And the biggest difference with this team this year as opposed to the past few years, now a little bit different two years ago because Jay Nivey was there and that loss to St. Peter's is still two years later. Just almost, To me, even more asinine than the, lo- the loss to Fairleigh Dickinson a year ago. Um, but their guards are just so much better this year. And they are. Smith's they can chew. improvement from a year ago is such a big difference. And you just mentioned it. Purdue's the number one three-point shooting team in the country. Where if you have a behemoth inside, it can shoot the three ball like that. In theory, you should be one of the three best teams in the country. And that's what Purdue is by all the metrics, Alex. I will ask you this, too, because this does worry me a little bit here. But looking at strength of schedule, okay, Gonzaga hasn't played a whole lot of good teams. Yeah. Their best win is Kentucky. So, I mean, look. And Purdue does have a pretty good non con So, so, so uh, here's the thing with Gonzaga. I mean, we've kind of been having this debate yeah. about them forever, right? Where their conference is usually St. Mary's and maybe a second team that's of NCAA tournament quality. This year was just St. Mary's, who, of course, got bounced in around the 64. Their non con was weaker this year than usual. I think the ma- main reason for that was the early, was the round one wa- loss in Maui. So instead of playing, remember, Purdue and Maui went Gonzaga, Tennessee, Marquette. Like, that's a, a, a wild early season tournament. Yes. Kansas in that, like, Kansas played Marquette and Tennessee on being on the winner's side. You going on the loser's side really hurt Gonzaga there. They played Syracuse and UCLA. Yeah. Like, neither of those teams were even close to the tournament. So it, that kind of hurt their strength of schedule, which made their non-con weaker. Remember, going into the Kentucky game, it was like, hey, they kind of have to win this game yes. to make sure they're clearly in the tournament. Obviously, we were all wrong because they got a five seed <laughs> after winning that game and not even winning the WCC tournament uh, with losing here in town to St. Mary's on March the 12th. Uh, but, no, you know what? I, I just, with Gonzaga at this point, I, I can't, you can't hold the schedule against them because they're still, I mean, this is, been in they basically have now been in the second weekend a decade long now yes which is nuts a small little school in spokane washington and they're 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 here every single year and this is mark few's third chance against purdue and zach Eady. so we'll see if he can uh come up with a new game plan like you said they they've got the bodies got the tall guys so because they did play last year as well. No, it's pretty amazing. Like, people still get on Mark Few. Oh, he's overrated. I mean, okay, he hasn't won a national championship. That's the only thing that's left on the ledger for him at this point. And again, look at what Gonzaga, I mean, Dan Monson got him to an Elite Eight. That was it. Small, tiny school playing in a, in a mediocre league. I mean, this is nine consecutive tournaments that they have been in the Sweet 16, regardless of result tonight. Incredible. I, I would argue this is actually his best coaching job in those nights. Right. Because this team really was mediocre until that win against Kentucky. And here they are, uh, I think, very much live to get to the Elite Eight uh, against Purdue tonight. All right, we're going to take a quick break. When we get back, uh, by the way, quick up to Indiana within five against South Carolina and Albany on the ladies' side. But the game of the night to me, and quite frankly, might even be the game of the tournament on paper to me. Creighton and Tennessee. We break that down. We also take an early look at the two Elite Eight matchups we know already when we get back on Sports by the Book, South Point Studio. South Point offers all the types of entertainment you'd expect at a first-class Las Vegas resort. Did you know our 400-seat showroom is one of Las Vegas' top destinations for live entertainment? Enjoy live performances by classic Vegas entertainers, bands, and today's hottest comedians, plus a rock and dance floor. You can also enjoy live entertainment at the Grand View Lounge, where you'll feel all the vibes of old Las Vegas. Enjoy the music, and if you love to laugh, don't miss The Dirty at 1230, our very own free comedy show, every Friday night at 1230 a.m. in the Grand View Lounge. The Dirty is 100% free, so arrive early. 
Go to SouthPointCasino.com or call the box office at 77136 for today's performances at the showroom and the Grandview Lounge. When you're ready for your favorite cocktail, stop in and unwind at one of our seven specialty lounges. There's a bar around every corner, because you're in Vegas, baby. South Point Casino has plenty of attractions for the whole family. Catch a movie. Our 16-screen movie theater includes two XD extreme screens for the ultimate in viewing, sound, and luxury. After the show, treat the family to a variety of treats at our old-fashioned ice cream parlor, Kate's Corner. We scoop up a variety of creamy concoctions, including smoothies, hand-dipped cones, milkshakes, malts, sodas, and sundaes. At Kate's, there's something for everyone. And if you've still got time to spare, our bowling center might be right up your alley. Voted Best of Las Vegas, it's a great place for friends and family fun. 64 lanes, a pro shop, snack bar, and arcade. And while the kids are bowling, you can play slots and sip on a drink in the Alley Cat Lounge while overlooking the lanes. For our more serious and professional bowlers, the South Point is also home to a separate tournament bowling plaza. We have 11 amazing restaurants featuring a wide variety for every price range and appetite. South Point's Garden Buffet has something for everyone at unbeatable prices. Or, if hunger strikes in the middle of the night, join us at Coronado Cafe. The American menu offers breakfast, lunch, or dinner 24 hours a day, plus a Chinese kitchen for authentic Chinese dishes from 11 a.m. to 11 p.m. From steak and eggs to wonton soup, it's fast and friendly service 24-7. When you need a quick pick-me-up, you can find it at our state-of-the-art Starbucks just inside the main South Point entrance. Order ahead with the Starbucks app for easy mobile order pickups. Or enjoy your favorites in the relaxing dining area anytime, day or night. If you love Mexican food, Baja Miguel's has all of your south of the border favorites. There are dozens of classics to choose from, like fajitas, ceviche, chimichangas, tacos, and more. And for spirit lovers, Baja's colorful non-smoking tequila bar is right outside. Or maybe you're in the mood for seafood. Big Sur Oyster Bar has fresh seafood prepared right before your eyes. Savor freshly shucked oysters, crab legs jambalaya, shrimp and lobster. Beers on tap and a selection of fine wines are perfect to pair with your seafood favorite. Whether lunch or dinner, you'll love this fun atmosphere located just off the casino floor. Ready to shake things up? Step back in time and treat yourself to one of the oldest restaurant chains in the country. Steak and Shake, famous for original mouth-watering steak burgers and hand-dipped milkshakes in a variety of flavors. For some old-fashioned fun, try Steak and Shake. Welcome back in Sports by the Book. South Point Studio. <laughs> we have fun sometimes here on set. Alex White's here. I'm Jeff Parles. Shout out to Jerry and Sean also doing a great job in the back again. I will, I will say this. I, I, a lesson for our guy, Sean, who is a uh, young guy, young guy, learning the ropes of betting baseball and uh, not enjoying it. <laughs> Long way to go. 160 more games. Yeah. <laughs> It's really tough, the money line sports, right? Because it took me a while to to adjust with hockey yeah. after going from football to basketball, and baseball is the same way. It's a really good point, honestly. You I didn't even I didn't even think about that, but you're 100 percent right. It's a, it's a it's a different. I don't want to say skill set, but it is it is you have to build your numbers out differently. You're you're not looking at t obviously it's run lines only in baseball, right? I, you're very I. I don't know how often you bet run lines unless if it's uh I mean I don't bet a lot of run lines. I'm usually I usually bet first five totals. That's usually what I'm looking at it these days. Well see, and that's funny because the hockey I really hone in on the totals. I like the totals more unless I just make a team way bigger favorite than the book has or vice versa. And I, I see some value on that underdog. But yeah, so for Sean, I'm sure some of these uh plus money prices with underdogs look a little flashy or you see a huge favorite, and you're like, there's no way they can lose, and you tie them up with another favorite, which can also get you in some trouble. So 
It's a learning. It's a learning curve, Sean. You'll get it. <laughs> <laughs> Jerry just sitting there, just look, watching us all have fun. He loves sports so yeah, much. The big, big puddles. The duck guy. He loves him. He loves him. Loves him. <laughs> all right. Real quick here, uh, mm-hmm. Alex. I, I just want to bring this up, where this was the whole week, two and a half, two, some three. And the market has come heavy on Tennessee so far today. Up to three and a half. Pretty much market wide now. Totals up to 146 from 142 and a half. I'm going to give you the floor first. This to me, on paper, going into this round, this was the one game I looked at and like, okay. I personally think it should be Tennessee one, which obviously is going to create a Creighton bet of some sort for me. But I think these teams are... I know all the eyeballs are on Purdue. I, I get it. But this feels like the winner of this game tonight is going to be representing this region in the, in the Final Four. And it would not shock me one bit if the winner of this game has the best crack of beating UConn in a national title game. It is tough. These teams are very different and yet very similar. Both kind of had a rough non-con. You mentioned it about Tennessee and that tournament. So they got three losses to three really good teams in that go round. But then they built themselves up. I mean, they won the SEC regular season and were by far the best team. I mean, Alabama won yesterday, but I still think Tennessee is definitely the best team we're, we're in, in, the, in that. that conference. Yeah, yeah. Um, didn't look good in the conference tournament, but on the flip side, Creighton had some really rough losses in non con. But once they got in their groove, they've looked um, very good. And don't forget, they are the last team to have beat Connecticut here. I thought that number was right. I do have a small future on Tennessee, so I'm, I'm going to take the points here with Creighton and try and middle it. I think you're right. I think this is a pretty evenly matched up game, and they can hang around in here, especially because we know how good they are shooting. The one thing that does make me a little bit nervous, and I'll see get your take on this, but looking at their opponent tracker here, uh, uh, Creighton's known for their offense, but it's really been the better defenses that have um, had Tennessee kind of struggling here. So I don't. I think they're going to be able to go toe to toe with them offensively. So going by the numbers, <laughs> this is a little bit of a tricky game. By the way, that I like handicapping this one because I. So Tennessee had the three point shooting game from hell last round. Made two threes, and he still advanced. Which, look, that's usually that's usually a see you later at that point in this tournament. If you are that bad shooting the ball from three in a game like that, you usually lose. We but, saw two yesterday. Well, we saw we saw a few a few things like that yesterday, where <laughs> where Caleb Love and uh, and R.J. Davis combined for as many three point makes as you and I did yesterday in L.A., which that's a that's zero that's a hearty zero, guys. Um, yeah, and that uh. that that did Arizona in. Yesterday, North Carolina, a little more complex than just yes. the bad shooting. But, yeah, your best shooter going 0 from 9 from 3. Yeah, that's probably going to do you in more times than not. Uh, but, look, I, this this Tennessee team, and look, fool me once, shame on you. Fool me twice, shame on me. Fool me all these times with Rick Barnes. I don't know who else to blame other than myself. Um, but I, this feels different for, for Tennessee than in the past. Because at least this go around, even though Connect had an off game against Texas, they have the they have the bucket getter. Dalton okay. Connect is as good of a bucket getter as there is in this tournament. Um, and they sur- and like I said, they survived the bad offensive effort, Alex. And now the problem with that is though, now they see Creighton, who was super lucky to get out at around a thirty two. Double overtime win against Oregon. Yeah, if you had the ducks, I know, I know it was a horrible beat. I know. I, I still was. But no amount of time will change that. You're going to remember that one for a long time. But you're down, down four with 16 seconds. You're supposed to lose that game. You're very lucky that Dana Altman, who was a great coach, made a surprising mistake with keeping Dante on the floor in a clear free throw shooting situation. So, I, look, I, both of these teams survived the game you're supposed to lose. And a lot of times in this tournament, that means a deep run's coming which obviously one of these teams can't win tonight because they're playing each other. When this is all said and done, Alex, the biggest reason I like Creighton tonight, okay, more so than anything. First off, uh, Vescovy, uh, Santiago Vescovy of Tennessee, is dealing with an illness. He will play tonight. 
But even though he is not as impactful as he's been in the past, that's still a veteran key cog to the operation for Tennessee that may not be 100%. But I like Creighton's guards as a whole better. I have Connect as a swing guy. I don't really count him as the ball-handling guards uh, like for Tennessee. And it's nothing against the guy Siegler, who's awesome. There's nothing against Vescovy, who's really good in his own right. But Trey, the combination of Alexander and Ashworth in the pure backcourt for Marquette, with Shireman basically playing as the third guard, as good as Connect is, I'll take... Creighton's trio and Creighton has a distinct advantage inside with Kalkbrenner who I think is the most underrated big guy in the country at this point and I know there I I know people have gotten on McDermott in the past heck Creighton until last year Creighton hadn't been in the second weekend in 30 plus years been a long time I I think you got a motivated team that should have been in the final four a year ago basically with the whole team back and with a coach who has turned into a, a really darn good coach after I had a lot of questions about McDermott when it was just, oh, I'm trying to build around my own, around Doug. <laughs> There's a reason that team never made it out of the first weekend. Uh, but I like the Blue Jays. I think when it's all said and done, and you know what the other factor here, Alex, that a lot of people won't get, uh, what we'll, we'll be surprised at. What's that? You look at the num the, the numbers. Creighton's numbers are more balanced. Tennessee's defense is third in the country. Their offense is thirtieth. Creighton's offense is tenth, and their their defense is twenty third. Creighton's technically more balanced than Tennessee is, which I guarantee you not many people realize that. Not to mention Creighton's defense would probably be a lot better if yes, teams didn't shoot. Yes, free throw defense. Yeah, <laughs> if teams just, just happen to shoot really well against them from the line. So there's nothing they can do about that. But, yeah, you're right. I mean, I think they're both pretty balanced. I think this is going to be a great game here tonight. It'll definitely go down to the wire. I, I, again, I think this is going into this weekend. I thought this was the best game of the weekend, period. I, I know some said Iowa State, Illinois. A reasonable game, but I thought Bama and North Carolina was going to be a really good game. I had no idea what to think about that game. <laughs> you, you know my thoughts on Bama, uh, and that will translate to tomorrow as well on that one. Real quick, real quick before we get out of here, uh, just just looking at tomorrow's games, Alex. Um, the East game is first. Uh, I said last night on on a Twitter machine that I I think Illinois is is somewhat live here. I think they're somewhat live. I'm not saying they're going to win the game. I'm not saying the number's not going to balloon to maybe nine, nine and a half by the time this game tips. But Illinois has the offense in order to they stay do. in this game, which not many other teams can say that. This is offense one against offense two tomorrow in Boston, Alex. Well, they need to be careful and they need to stay out of foul trouble because they definitely need Shannon throughout that entire game and to be able to play as many minutes as he can. But I made the game 10 um, early number here before really adjusting from last night's game. So off of that, but yeah, it's going to be a good game. We'll, we'll see if they can hang in there. Right now, uh, the number on that game tomorrow sitting at eight and a half with a total of 155 on Connecticut and Illinois. And then the late game, Bama and Clemson, Alabama's two and a half, 164 and a half. Good luck trying to handicap this game, guys. Oh good luck. I have absolutely nothing on this one at this moment. Maybe I'll have a prop or something by the time this game tips tomorrow, but I don't know how the heck you can bet on either of these teams where, again, Clemson has been so charmed with their teams forgetting how to shoot the ball in this tournament, and Alabama is Alabama, where you have no idea what you're getting on a game-to-game -game basis other than the fact that they're going to keep running up and down the court as fast as they can. You don't think we're going to get another great performance from Grant Nelson? I, that was one of the most amazing <laughs> things I've ever seen. Uh, actually, do you want fun with numbers real quick? Yes. Quick, which, uh, I texted this to Jim Root, and uh, he responded with out of body, some word I can't say on the air. Grand Nelson, okay, yesterday. Number of times these individual feats have occurred in an NBA, WNBA, or Div 1 men's or women's games over the last 25 years, okay? Okay. 20 plus points, about 350,000 times that's happened. 10 plus rebounds, about a quarter million times that's happened. Five plus blocks, about 20,000 times that's happened. Free throws. 10 plus free throws made in the same game, 40,000 times. 60% 60 per, 60 are better from the field for an individual player, 1.1 million times. 100% three point percentage, 250,000 times. All the above in the same game, one. Oh my God. Last night with Grant Nelson, <laughs> one.
<laughs> that is awesome. What? That's from OptiStats on, on Twitter. It happened one time. Wow. In 25 years, all that's happened for the same dude and one or dude or, or woman in the same game. And if it's the right game for that to happen for you. Exactly. The right time for that. Yes. <laughs> nonsense to happen. Uh, oh, my goodness. Uh, craziness when it's all sudden. This tournament brings the wildest stuff, as it always does. All right. That's all the time we have today. Tomorrow, Alex and I are back at 830 in the morning. Previewing the Elite Eight. We'll have some baseball talk as well. Uh, you might even have some hockey plays on a loaded Saturday uh, yes. as well. Uh, good Definitely. luck tonight up at the ballpark. Thank uh, you. Opening night for basically everyone on our crew, but they're already up there except for you. Uh, good luck. Thank hopefully, you. For, hopefully Frank doesn't drive you too crazy tonight uh, in the in-game entertainment for the Aviators and the uh, and it's Reno tonight, It right? is Reno Aces, yeah. yeah. Okay. We got the in-state rivalry right off the bat. But, yeah, opening night for minor league baseball pretty much everywhere. Is, so. it a, uh, is there a cup involved for uh, the Aviators and the Aces? No, no, not. That's the truth. That, that's yeah, we should get something involved. We should get something there for sure. All right, I'll see you tomorrow. Sports by the Book, South Point Studio.